Welcome, everyone, to Then and Now. I'm Brad Sham, and we are delighted to be able to bring you um, grown-up, unedited, for the most part, visits with uh, real-life flesh-and-blood people, uh, mostly in the history of the Dallas Cowboys, then and now. And our guest on this episode of Then and Now is, I will tell you in all candor, one of my very favorite players in now 44 years broadcasting these games, uh, for a variety of reasons, and therefore it saddens me a little that I probably have to tell you who Larry Cole is. <laughs> but uh, first, let me welcome our guest who has a new book, Living the Dream on America's Team, Number 63, Larry Cole, how good of you to come in. Great well, to be with you. Thank you, Brad. It's so good to see you after all these years. It's been a long time, and yeah. and I, I was thinking as I was, as I was reading your book and as I was thinking about how great a story you have, in my opinion, in your years before you came to the NFL, but right. certainly in your years with the Cowboys, and it's been 40 years since you played. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes me want to lie down. Does it feel like that long to you? You know, it, when I started, uh, you know, when I retired from the, uh, you know, construction, you know, business a year ago, you know, I just said, okay, I'm going to take a time to reflect. And I, uh, you know, then I said, damn, I, God, I did a bunch of things, didn't I? Holy crap. And it's like, and, you know, thinking back to my feelings as a little boy on the farm, you know, and then a scared cadet at the academy, and then, you know, a rookie with the Cowboys, all those things. And it just kind of felt, you know, I went from step to step to step. And uh, so uh, to tell you the truth, because I did this, and it's it's almost a good psychological reason to do the book, is that it was fun to refresh my memories, and it's even more fun to run across the people that I met in my book sightings that are old neighbors and friends and compadres and, you know, <laughs> uh, critics. I mean, I mean, fun critics, you know, yeah. banter critics. And uh, I, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, musicians do a farewell tour. I'm kind of doing a farewell tour. <laughs> but Well, musicians... Don't do farewell tours anymore. They just age and continue to play. <laughs> that's so. true. I mean, Willie Nelson. It's like, well, that's one thing I can't do is continue to play football. <laughs> no, but you're. But you are. You yeah. are there. Here's the thing. This is a great yeah. book for cowboy fans. Yeah. But to me, and we're going to get into it. This is this is a really good lesson on how the world has changed, yeah. and for young people. Uh, what they have that they don't know that they have. But we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. So, again, yeah. I, I, I feel the need uh, to uh, really introduce the world again to Larry Cole, who uh, was a 16th-round draft choice in a 17-round draft in 1968. Uh, if you look in the media guide, it says Larry went to Hawaii, which is true, but he, as he just alluded to, he played – three years at the Air Force Academy, and then uh, checked into the University of Houston for a minute. And that turned out to have uh, a little bit of an impact on your professional career, and we'll, and we'll touch on that. Um, the first thing, and, and, and by the way, you said in, you start this book in the prologue, uh, let me introduce myself I'm Larry Cole, but this is, as you read these paragraphs, it sounds like this is maybe a conversation you had more than once with someone recently, <laughs> because people who are younger, yeah, they didn't know you played. And oh, they I know. Didn't know if what you did. If you're younger than 45, you've never heard of me, and it's like, no, I don't know. And then, but I mean, it's a true story. One of my subcontractors, uh, he's an electrician in Dallas, and I was finishing up the job here, and. <laughs> And uh, he had his young guys, and he he told them, yeah, he played for the NFL. And they looked, yeah, right. And then <laughs> they looked at me and said, did you really? Said, yeah, I did. And then he said, Google it. And these days, you know, everything's on the Internet. And and really the whole, you know, concept of writing a book is so much different now because, you know, digital access, social media, all the things, rather than just peddling books. And uh, anyway, it's it's been a... 
you know, it's it's been a interesting uh, thing to do, and I, you know, I have enough time to do it, and that gives me enjoyment because I can, you know, enjoy the social relationship where running a construction business is all detail, 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 and you're constantly thinking, calculating, planning, you know, the whole thing, and so it's been a nice retirement therapy. Uh, and we'll get into the construction business because you you started it while you were playing, and then right. by the time you retired after the 80 season, right? That was your right. last year? Yes. So you became one of the most successful home builders in the area, particularly in the mid-cities. Right. And that was something that the farm boy in Minnesota that you describe in the right. early pages would never have had no way. any idea about. But let me let me just still address... Uh, the people who who didn't get to see you play and didn't get to read about you. So, sixty-eight to eighty, sixteenth round draft choice, and uh, partly because of an injury to the guy in front of you, Willie Towns, but only partly. You started most of your rookie year, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I started the fifth game after he got hurt. That didn't happen. Tom Landry or other NFL coaches were not starting rookies in the late 60s. Right. So that had to speak to what you brought. And and I have always told people, because uh, I think it's true, that you were not the most athletic guy that, that <laughs> anybody ever saw play, but you were one of the smartest. And for Landry to have that kind of faith in you, you had to have a lot going on. Mm-hmm. Now, you also write in here that you never had a surgery in all that time. How was that even possible? Because you started most yeah. of the time, a lot of years at defensive end, and yeah. then inside at defensive tackle. Yeah. How did you avoid having any surgeries? Well, <laughs> uh, I would say my, you know, my mentor Bob Lilly was, you know, awfully good on teaching how to protect yourself and, you know, get in situations now. I mean, he, you know, he tore up his, you know, his knee and real bad at the end there. And I never got that. The only, my worst in- injury was the hyperextended knee. And these days they do kind of scope surgery or get in there and clean it out and all that. Well, you know, it's like once you have knee surgery and you go to the veterinarian, you know, up in Bonham, <laughs> Dr. Knight. <laughs> Dr. Marvin Knight. He was a legend in his, in his own right. That's right. And uh, once you have that, just like, you know, I don't know, well, you weren't here for the, you know, the 60s, but, you know, uh, Leakey, Don, I forget, there's about six, seven of those offensive linemen. They were all just beaten up after seven, eight years, and it's like, I'm not going to do that. And so – uh, all we did was, uh, you know, hot and cold, iced it, got it down, and seven weeks later, you know, I'm back on the field. And then, you know, last year in the NBA Finals, you know, Giannis comes back after two weeks with that same injury. I mean, you know, the foot went forward, and it's absolutely amazing how they can do that now. And, and by the way, you, you have a, a scene in the book where you, you – there are several – in fact – this was in uh, 1970 because you missed right. the Monday night loss to the yes. Cardinals, after which one of the most legendary stories in that era of the Cowboys right. was that the coaches got so disgusted with the players who had fallen to five and four right. that they basically left practice and said, you guys play touch football or whatever the hell you want to do. Yeah. And the story is that Leroy Jordan kind of took it over. Mm-hmm. And after that, the team kind of yeah. took off. But yeah. you weren't even at practice. You were hurt then. Yeah. No, I know. I was. I had broken my arm. You know. I mean, I think it told us. You know. You know, Ernie Stottner and you know, tough old Pittsburgh Steeler. You know, Hall of Famer. You and know, the Cowboys' defensive coach. coordinator and defensive line right, coach. exactly. And you know, he was my line coach and everything. And so, you know, I mean, it. He, uh, you know, he just uh, was able to, uh, you know, kind of. Put me in position where, uh, you know, I could, you know, try to keep up. You know, like I said, I I was like I was, you know, I was a little brother of the family, and you know, I was like the little brother. All these other guys in their prime, and and I mean, nobody executed the flex defense better than Doomsday One. 
<laughs> and you get to doomsday too, and they were so athletic, they didn't have to do it They didn't perfectly. have to worry about it. No. Well, one of the things that really tickled me was uh, you tell the story of coming back from that injury in 1970, yeah. and the doctor finally, you, you, you can finally get out of the house, you can finally do yeah. some some exercises, some rehab, and then the doctor says to you, uh, about another week you'll yeah. be able to go. <laughs> right. And right after that, Tom Landry comes in, and I can hear his voice saying, uh, you're suiting up this week, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah, that was a hyper extension. That was seven weeks. But the, the uh, you know, I broke my arm because Ernie, you know, we had lost you know, the week before that game to St. Louis, and he was all pissed off. And, you know, and Ron East, uh, yeah, well, you know of Ron East, but he wasn't here when you were. Right. But, I mean, he, you know, he's a tough Marine, and he wasn't going to take any crap from me. You know, I hit him harder and harder and <laughs> went in, put a donut on it, you know, the send back out, and then I really broke it <laughs> across the way. But I played the Super Bowl, you know, in the cast with that hand, and I came back after four weeks. And But, you know, I was around the team, but I wasn't there in the practice field. But it it really – it was taken off the pressure because Tom was pressing so hard. I mean, he wanted so bad for us, you know, to win it. And all of a sudden, you know, the players uh, took – control of the situation of leadership on and off the field. Uh, Dave Edwards, I mentioned him, you know, when we were talking earlier. Great it's Cowboys like, linebacker. Keep them out of the zone. And, you know, we did play in, you know, Cleveland in the mud. It's like, here we go again. We're going to lose and be out of the Because players. you'd lost to Cleveland in the championship the game the previous, last two years. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, and then we, you know, get to, you know, the, the first playoff game against Detroit and then, you know, I mean, we damn near lost that game, but I mean, it was a tough, and I guess we won what six to five, five, to, no, nothing, five, to, five nothing. to nothing, five to nothing, yeah, five to nothing, and you know, it was that that determination that that we took through that year, and uh, as I said in the book, once we got to the Super Bowl, and it was the Blooper Bowl, and everything went against it, and everything, and. But we were, you know, we got to the party and we were so damn proud of what we had done and it meant the world to us. And when we got home, that fans met us, you know, after we even lost, you know. And, you know, it's like, okay, we got this. <laughs> I told you the second time we lost to Cleveland, I had eggs thrown in my front door. I'd bought a house in North Dallas. It's like, God. And I, you know, I left the next day to finish college in Minnesota. <laughs> so it's like I didn't have to deal with this. <laughs> um I, I, again, I, I want to make sure that everyone listening who never saw you play, and um, you know, I don't think ego has ever been anything that you had to overcome, <laughs> and, and so you yeah. understand that there's a lot of people who never heard of you. Yeah. But I'd like you to read on the very last page of your book. We yeah. each have a copy here. Yeah. Uh, that second paragraph from the top, because I want I want you to tell people what Tom Landry said about you at your retirement press conference where you said it was now time for Tom Landry to speak. Okay. Uh, okay let's second see. paragraph. Second paragraph. Top, okay. Yeah. It was now time for Tom Landry to speak. He said, I respect the person Larry is as I did Roger, who, you know, retired the year before. When a player of this caliber makes that decision, I know it wasn't done for any other reason than what is best for him and his family. When you do that, I don't try to talk him out of it even though I'd like to. We'll miss Larry Cole as a person more than anything else. I know that if I had 45 guys like Larry Cole, I'd never retire because they'd be a pleasure to coach, and I know they'd contribute greatly to the team. Did you know he felt that way about you? No. <laughs> oh, I actually, I did. You know the, and, and let me just interrupt you. Yeah. One other thing you said a few pages before that, uh, that uh, Charlie Waters uh, – Talking to Ernie Stotner, yeah, asked Ernie who was the most competitive guy right. on the defense, and Ernie said Larry Cole, yeah. not Bob yeah. Lilly, not Leroy yeah. Jordan, not Chuck Howley, not Mel Renfro. These were great players, all pros, Hall of Famers, and Ernie Stotner said the most competitive guy on our defense is Larry Cole. Yeah, and did you know he felt that way? Actually, I think he did. I mean, I think I did know that. Uh, you know, I mean, they don't normally talk about it, but, you know, Tom Landry, I mean, I, I was, 
you know, I was in sync with him coming to the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, I was a Green Bay Packer fan, you know, but uh, Tom Landry had been in the military. I had been in the military. You know, he took industrial engineer. I took civil engineering, you know, I think like that way. And, and he was such a fair and, and, you know, straightforward guy that I felt like I would get every opportunity. But, you know, along the way, you know, meanwhile, uh, you know, you're always in search. And the, and the game was moving, you know, to faster ends and quicker ends and everything. And, you know, every year, you know, Tony Smith was one year. He's going to replace me. And, and then, uh, you know, after that, it was. Uh, then you moved inside. It was Bill Gregory. Right. Right. It was, you know, well, first Harvey came in and backed up, but, you know, he wasn't tough enough. And then Ernie, I give him the credit to, you know, make him tougher. And, and Two Tall Jones was backing up Pat Toomey in the right. And then, you know, the next year, uh, you know, they switch it around and Two Tall's on the left, Harvey's on the right. And so I'm, you know, I'm playing alternating with Bill at, you know, right tackle. And then, you know, the week before the first game of the season, uh, you know, and it's Tom Lee. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, yeah, we're going to uh, start Randy White, uh, at, you know, at the uh, tackle. Uh, Who had been playing linebacker. Yeah, been playing years. linebacker, and it's like, well, we got to get him the field. We're going to play him. That's like, okay. <laughs> and it's like, God, are you kidding me? But, yeah, I don't hold it against Tom Landry because I know, and I agreed with it, to get him on the field. It's like. But just at, not necessarily. In well, legs, I mean, I was so expendable that. You know, I got replaced by a guy you know that made all pro and was co MVP of the Super Bowl. <laughs> so they had a hard time replacing me at right tackle. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But I played the piano and I played three different, you know, positions and started at three different positions in the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, all right. Now, so now now if you as, as the rappers say, if you don't know, now you know. Now if uh, if you didn't have any idea who Larry Cole was or is uh, or why you should read his book, Living the Dream on America's Team. Uh, you've got a little sense of it now. So now we're going to go back because it's then and now. So um, I tell people all the time that you are the author of my very favorite play in all of the years I've been fortunate enough to broadcast Cowboy games. Um, so I will set the scene and let you describe the play. Mm-hmm. It is December uh, 1979 at Texas Stadium. It's the last game of the regular season against the hated Washington team. The uh, winner is going to win the division. The loser is probably going to miss the playoffs, which is what happened to Washington. And the Cowboys have a lot of injuries on offense. And it's back and forth. Washington's up by two or three scores, and the Cowboys come back and catch up slowly and Pull even John Riggins, Hall of Fame running back, takes a pitch out, goes around right end, 66 yards for a touchdown. The Cowboys keep clawing back in. Now Washington's got a six-point lead. Um, In your book, you described it as near midfield. I couldn't remember if it was closer to the 20, but it was around the two-minute warning. Mm -hmm. You guys are out of timeouts. They've got third and middle to short. All they've got to do is make a first down. The game's over. Hmm. And they wind up running the same pitch play to Riggins, who I won't insult you if I suggest he was faster than you. (laughs) I don't think so. Uh, They run the same play that he took 66 yards for a touchdown. Now, uh, it's so this is a third down play. Hmm. Pick it up for me, please. This is my favorite play in 43 years. Well, you know, this was you know this is the year that Tutal was out boxing. You know, it's like, gee, thanks, Tutal. I really <laughs> appreciate that. You know, and you know, first, you know, we get to the start of the season, and they were trying to get Larry Buffet in there, but he just wasn't, you know, measuring up. So the last week, I moved to left end. It's like, oh my God, you got to do off season training. It's a different position, different steps, and everything. And then they brought in John Dutton, which was great. And, you know, just kind of stabilized it. But we, you know, we were soft. We were, you know, we were tough and competitive, and we did the best we can. So, you know, we would give up, you know, bend but don't break kind of, you know, defense and did pretty good most of the time. But anyway, this was, you know, in that particular play, I'd seen it earlier, and, you know, that play has a counter. You know, you go out, and then you get everybody going, and then you, you know, hand it up the middle. 
So, you know, it was, you know, to me, my choice whether or not I think they would go up the middle or they'd go out. But, you know, I I read the, you know, the, the tackle, and the, especially the center, uh, you know, uh, he just seemed to be leaning out to the outside. And so instead of taking a step up and reacting, I took a step sideways and went from here to there. And so, you know, I mean, football is all about the angles. And because of that, I got out there and, uh, you know, made the tackle. And, you know, the whole crowd erupted. It just like felt like they made the tackle with me. And, you know, the, you know, I mean, you know, athletes like Steve, you know, Stephen Curry and, you know, all these great stars, you know, they get the roar. They get it. And but it's that's the only time I think that I ever had that feeling. And it was so satisfying, you know, to to do that and especially with a weaker team. And, you know, I mentioned the book and, you know, walked off the field, looked at Tom Landry, looked at each other, and it's like, yeah, we won this. You know, we're better. And and, and that play was really all about your football intellect your your set yeah. your engineering background right. was like you said all angles um but you you were not faster than riggins but no. you ran i don't think you were touched yeah. from the snap of the ball right. because they were try as you said they were yeah. trying to fake the counter yeah. but you ran in between all the blockers yeah i just and, scraped off of the you know the in back of the guard you know right to it and of course, and then Tom Landry said, "Well, if I knew you that fast, I would have been harder than you in practice." <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You were sandbagging. In my memory, uh, Riggins didn't get the ball on the wide pitch from Joe Theismann more than a second or two before you were on top of him. Well, it was. I mean, no, it was. It was out to the flat. Is when I, you know, I got there, and uh, so you know, I probably. Traveled probably about seven yards, and uh, but I, you know I rem I remember you know hearing the rebroadcast, and I mean you and Charlie what Charlie was you know hurt that year and subbing in and you know Charlie's saying you got to love it you've you got gotta to love believe got to believe and see I feel like the years that I played you know I'm I'm a bit of a team historian you know on Doomsday one and two and. That's how we were America's team in the 70s, you know. I think it's too loosely, you know, used these days, you know, from two different eras. And in in my mind, uh, you know, the older teams don't get, you know, enough credit of the whole Landry era. And it's like the Landry area, you know, it's the – the uh, uh, Jimmy Johnson Jimmy era. Johnson yeah. era, really – you know, and, and a little bit of Switzer, but, you know, and then kind of the rest. And, you know, it's, I mean, the rules change, game change. I, I get all that. But, you know, uh, you know, I see the videotape, the history of the Cowboys, and, you know, 75% of it, you know, is after, you know, Tom Landry. And it's like, yeah, that's past in memory. But you don't know how many people, you know, remember buying $1 seats at the old Cotton Bowl and, you know, how many, you know, still put L Tom Landry up in – you know, in just a whole different, you know, category. And, of course, these are the, the fans from 45 to, you know, 70, 80 years old. So there's um, there's a, a couple of things. Uh, one is that um, there's frequent debates among Cowboy fans about um, which team was better, 92, 93, or the 77 team. Yeah. And uh, you write in your book, um, oh, come on, Bubba, you can turn the phone off for crying out loud. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, you write You write in your book, and again, it's Larry Cole, whose book is Living the Dream on America's Team. You write that you thought the 70-71 team, which went to back-to-back -back Super Bowls, finally mm -hmm. won the one in 71, mm -hmm. uh, you thought that was a better team you didn't say more talented, but you said a better team right. than the one that beat Denver in New Orleans in 77. Why would you think that? Because of the discipline that we were earlier talking about, you know, after, you know, losing to St. Louis. And, and we were all, you know, holding each other accountable. 
uh, getting ready to play, getting the right mindset. It was kind of like, okay, it's December, you know, you got family and everything. No, our number one priority is football for a month. You know, you can get back to your families after that. And we just made it, you know, our business to do it. And then, you know, we had that disappointing loss, and then Landry had to play, you know, multiple quarterbacks and get that out of his system, and, and then Roger won 10 in a row. But uh, once we got on that roll and started winning the close ones, you know, we went into the Dolphin game just confident. We were scared. It's like, you know, this could happen again. And we were just relieved when we won it. You know, it was still exciting. But the 77 team was so damn talented. You know, I mean, you know, I was – and actually, it was – you know, for me, it's like that's uh, one of the only years that I really didn't play much. And – but, I, you know, I substituted quite a bit. And so I was fresh, and it really kind of recharged me. And it's like I was going to retire after that. Okay, they got everything, you know, covered. And then I said, eh you know, I feel pretty damn good. I still want to keep going. And I'm glad I did. Um, you um, you talked about uh, the focus of the team, uh, 70-71, and being yeah. really the, – yeah. the one thing I wanted to ask you about as I was reading this book and thinking about how uh, – you, I mean, you, you could not have had, by today's standards – I don't know yeah. if you felt this way living it, but by today's standards, you couldn't have had a more rigorous upbringing, yeah. Spartan – upbringing than you did in Minnesota on your family's yeah. farm. And you yeah. worked it from the time you were a little boy yeah. and you write a lot about that. Uh, boy, I think every kid should read about what you and your siblings and your parents and aunts and uncles, your, what, what you all did. Cause that was how you lived. That was mm-hmm. what you were doing. You didn't right. really think about it. Um, and then you, it sounded like you came to football late Mm-hmm. It, you didn't yes. have a driving passion in the eighth grade. You didn't imagine playing in the NFL. No. And the one thing that you hear a lot today is about the the value of finding a player who really loves football mm-hmm. and who and how teams really try to weed out the ones who in the vernacular, just don't love football. Mm-hmm. But the life that you describe living, really, almost until you went into the Air Force Academy, did not sound like anybody who loved football. Not that you didn't like it. It just wasn't a priority. So how did you come to the game? Well, I just, you know, my brother, you know, played football, and he was a four-year letterman. And, you know, I mean, this is a small town, you know, Minnesota, about 3,000 people. And, uh, and plus the farms, you know, around the way for, you know, the students, but he had a full scholarship to the university of Nebraska. And, and, and so when he, he, when I was in seventh grade, he went, went off to play for them and he played freshman ball and he got hurt and then he got hurt again as a sophomore and he ended up just giving it up and got a survey job in the off season and end up, you know, being a civil engineer for about 50, 60 years. And, uh, and that was, you know, his deal. And, you know, and I, you know, I kind of had the same, you know, interest in, in civil engineering and that type of thing. And my mother was such a stickler in education. And, you know, it was, you know, the whole point was a means to an end. But with my dad, you know, be a man that can do a day's work. It's like you're measured by doing your work and being proud of it and, and I took that all the way through my career. That's it's like, hard work. Yes, I hard mean, work. And as I a loved, kid, and you yeah, loved it. I loved it because I uh, – And not nine to five. No, no, no. It was long days, and, and especially working for other farmers. You know, that, you know, they're paying you, not much, but they're paying you to do work, and so you, know, you do it. And, and then uh, I just took pride of, you know – doing and finishing any job of whatever you're doing. And as I get older, it kind of relieves the stress and tension by doing that. And I still, I mean, I'm, I'm making a little cat house right now because I've got to do something, you know, creatively to, you know, just kind of entertain myself. Um, 
when do you think you, if you ever really yeah. did, fell in love yeah. with football? Well, okay, yeah, getting to that point. Okay, so basketball was my first love. I mean, even from the third, fourth, and there's grade. a picture of you dunking a basketball yeah, in yeah. here. Yeah, I know, and I, I trust you. That's not doctored. No, it's not. I, uh, <laughs> in fact, one of my good Air Force friends was a college basketball player there in at Hawaii, and, and he said, "I didn't know you played basketball." I said, yeah, <laughs> I was a hell of a rebounder, and uh, but uh, you know, anyway, I I was uh, you know kind of the third best player on the team as a junior, and that was the year we damn near won the state and had a hell of a team. But uh, I there's a writer called Lefty Ranweiler in the Wilmer, you know, area, and uh, which is like 30 miles from Grand Falls, and he covered all the teams around there. And, you know, and, and we were starting to win, and I was starting to get noticed, you know, and because – uh, so you were playing football just because it was what you did then, not yeah. because you were burning with the right. It's, to play it's like you know, it's two sports. You know, basketball I went first, but all the guys, you know, you know, it's kind of like you're just expected in these little towns. Okay, well, you're playing football, but I started, you know, getting a feel for it when I was a sophomore, and then my junior year, I was, you know, making a bunch of plays, and you know, I don't think it took till about the end years of my. Uh, you know, pro football that I realized that I had, you know, good quick hand eye, you know, coordination and lower center of gravity. And, you know, I was able to, you know, shed box easily. And so I did that both in college and high school. And I was, you know, usually the top lineman, you know, at all those places I went to. And then you get to the Cowboys and it's like, what is this? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's flex defense. I mean, it's like, Step, step in a paint bucket here and then go there and they're going to run over you. And it's like, well, you learn that, you know, it's harder on the tackle to, to have to go that extra distance to block you because, you know, you could sidestep them. So, you know, you kind of learn the trade. But, I mean, the the guys, I mean, I mean all of them, I mean, I, you know, just think the world of, you know, Bob and, and Jethro and George. And, you know, they just helped bring me along. And, you know, by the next season, you know, I had – Pretty well got it, you know, together. And so, you know, I was the, you know, I was the defensive end, you know, when we won the first Super Bowl. And, you know, we didn't back up in those days. And so it isn't like everybody comes in and, you know, uh, relieves you. And you played uh, six preseason games. And yeah. you practiced in full pads twice a day yeah. and beat the hell out of each other yeah. all through camp and yeah. during the week. Yeah. yeah. And and what do you think now when you see when you see the way it is now? <laughs> well, it's I tell you what, it's it it's a made for, you know, T V show, you know, it's like I mean, who's gonna pay you two, three hundred dollars for, you know, a ticket or at least, you know, I mean, but it's like this is a different class of thing. I, you know, kind of chuckled to, you know, Aaron Donald, who's actually my favorite defensive tackle in the NFL, and he's also an engineering student, by the way, or graduate in it. And so when I was his age, I made thirty-one five, and next year he's going to get thirty-one five plus zero zero zero. <laughs> yeah, you made thirty-one thousand dollars, five hundred, and he's making thirty-one million. Right. <laughs> and and if I'd told you when you made your biggest contract that that would happen someday that uh, that a, yeah. the top defensive tackle yeah would make 31 yeah. million what w- yeah. what would you have said to that? Well, I I would, you know, say that's, you know, impossible of, you know, how all these things work, but it's uh, it's a different game, but still it's a very entertaining game and it's, you know, I hate to see, you know, players move around like that you know i mean from team to team you mean yeah i mean in my opinion you know you know the fans are the ones that are you know kind of cut short on this thing on you know it's it's nice you can sign players in bring them in bring them out but you know the over the years you get attached to these players and you you know blowing their family you know you just that's part of the team and you know that's why i said i feel like i played in the greatest era of the NFL, and so does Bob Lee. He says the same thing. Even though we didn't make all that money, you know, that they're making now, but we had a great life experience. And, I mean, frankly, uh, 
in my mind, my my life would have been incomplete if all I did is played football, made a bunch of money, and just did a whole bunch of promotion and advertising. You know, I I really really enjoyed you know the business that I was in, and that really fulfilled me. And that was kind of the point of the book. It's like, well, I used football for my number one obsession. You know, was to have my own business and run it and. Uh, I did that, and I went through all the ups and downs on it and have no regrets, and, you know, it was just uh, – and that's kind of what the book is that for younger people, you know, they got to see – you know, you kind of find out where your talent is and what you are good at and, you know, just keep finding and searching and try and, you know, you fail, you adjust and do all these things, and, and so uh, – I don't expect, you know, younger people to buy the book, but I do expect a lot of fathers to understand what I'm trying to say. And even, you know, with my children, you know, I mean, I mean, they worked, I mean, they didn't work as hard as I did, nor did I work as hard as my parents did at all. I mean, my God, I mean, they, I mean, my dad had to use horses to, you know, till the fields. That was a different deal. And, you know, it was just a different kind of era, but it's still, you know, a lot of the basics are still there. You quote your mother as saying more than once, uh, football's a means to an end. Mm-hmm. So she didn't object to you playing. Right. But you weren't raised to think that your objective is to play no, football. No, not when, at all. when when in there yeah. did you realize and, and I guess by now yeah. you're with you're with yeah. the Cowboys, uh, that the construction and home building business would be something that would kind of light your fire. Well, when I worked for and by the, the way, there may be as many people who are, who have heard of Larry Cole Holmes yeah. as saw you play who are listening to us yeah. right now. Well, it, it was the Hearst Uless Bedford era, you know, great fine Colleyville in, in South Lake and, you know, where I did, you know, my development work and did a little bit in Arlington, but it's a short period of time. But, uh, uh, as far as when I I, I got that interest, uh, I mean, when I worked for those two Veldi farmers, they both b- built the Quonset hut, and I just loved putting that together and, you know, putting on the shingles and raising and see how the foundation works and do all that. And it's like, and then I worked at a lumber yard, and, you know, I, my job was to build uh, gale box trailers, you know, for silage and, you know, to pull around and, I did that job, and it was around the lumber. I mean, sometimes I'd have to start stock two by fours. That was a that was a pain in the ass. But <laughs> anyway, it was a nice little thing. And then I went off to college to be you know the engineer, and I tried engineering. But you can't play football and work for a company engineer. It's like that doesn't work that way. I mean, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, why don't you call uh, you know Cole in San Francisco and ask him about this you know engineering thing? It's like no, that ain't gonna happen. So. That's where I kind of got the idea that, you know, <laughs> the only only time you're going to get any respect is if you're signing the paycheck and you're, you know, figuring out, you know, what you got to do. And I kind of self-taught myself, but I had some, you know, really uh, good people in, in the Hershey List Bedford that, uh, you know, helped me out get started. And it's uh, just uh, I have such uh, good memories of, of how it all came together and, Many, you know, many things and disappointments, but, you know, when you live your life and you look at the whole, you know, mask of it, it's like, yeah, there were a whole lot more good things going on. And I, and I thank my, my foundation. Uh, a lot of speakers talk about that, but, you know, I came from good folks, uh, solid people that had the right attitude of, you know, how to raise, you know, families and everything. And, you know, every generation is rebellious from the next and next. And, you know, we see it come, but, you know, my kids turn out well, my grandchildren turn well, so there must be something, you know, that, you know, you pass along that maybe they'll do. But you know, it's like my grandson said, well, it's like, I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah, grandparents are pretty neat, but, you know, you can just go to Wikipedia and get answers to all of this. <laughs> all right, I got two or three other real quick things I want to ask you about. They're not necessarily real quick. I don't want to give them short shrift, but – yeah. Um, so one is the title of your book, Living the Dream on America's Team. Yeah. And the Cowboys did not come to be called America's Team until after the 1977 Super Bowl. Right. 
And that was the name that NFL Films, not Tex Schramm, although he later said he wished he'd thought of it. Yeah. But America, uh, America's team was the name that NFL Films gave to the Cowboys championship season highlight film. Mm-hmm. And I, I had players in, in the year or two after that tell me that was players didn't really like that very much because they heard about it on the field yeah. from other players. I remember Pat Donovan was a starting offensive yeah. tackle and, yeah. Pat used to say every defensive lineman that lines up over me would say just before the snap of the ball, here's your America's team, and then <laughs> bring a, a little extra. Did you yeah. experience that? What was your your player's eye perspective of the team being called America's team? Well, you know, you know, I, I probably had a different, you know, mentality than other guys, but, you know, my favorite introduction, you know, was, uh, you know, coming out at, at the RFK Stadium in Washington, getting booed, <laughs> you know, and so, uh, you know, having that name at first, it's like, well, you know, Tex Ram, you know, he wanted to win, be the first to win three Super Bowls, and it's like, damn it, Tex, don't say that, you know, before the Super Bowl and get them all riled up. Now that bothered me more, but the America's team, I mean, frankly, I think it was born on. Uh, you know, the Hail Mary pass game and Roger Staubach and then Roger's interviews and, you know, with Phyllis George and, you know, that whole thing that you kind of set it up. And, and like I said, by the time of that 79 game, it's like, you know, we're just different than everybody else and we're damn proud of it. Um, you've mentioned the flex defense, mm-hmm. which uh, I don't even begin to know how to describe to today's fans, but it was completely Mm counterintuitive for especially the front seven. So in just a couple of minutes, how, and you say in your book, this was nothing like I'd never been exposed to anything like this. And you jump in and you figure out a way to start after Willie Towns got hurt right away. But how would you best describe the flex defense? Well, it's, I mean, it's a series of picks like basketball picks is really what it is. And what you're trying to do is, you know, you're trying to set up Leroy Jordan, you know, to scrape off the back and make the plays. And if this happens, this happens, you loop in, you loop out, you know, you've got to read, you know, the tackle and the guard. And I mean, it's really important in college. You know, I just hit the guy in front of me, threw him off and, you know, looked for the ball, but this was different. You had to discipline yourself, put yourself in position to do it. And, you know, it was, it was just, so unnatural to do that, but you know, uh, so many guys and a lot of guys came in, and I mentioned that you know they were good players that they just couldn't you know pick Coy, that up. Coy Bacon was Coy one Bacon, you, you know, Clarence Williams. Well, he he probably could have picked it up. He went to Green Bay, but uh, you know, there's a you know a few others that you were that way. And and Ch- and Chuck Howley, you remember yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. thing, you, the story that you told in the book about. Yeah. I guess it was your rookie year, right? Yeah, and you're yeah. starting, and what yeah. did you say to Chuck Howley in, in the middle of a game? Well, it was like, you know, I was like, I didn't quite hear the call and everything. It's like, you know, do I line up here? And he says, I don't care. Just get the hell out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> and that actually was a preseason game. Okay. By the time I was a starter, he was very supportive of me and, you know, to do it. And But he was the one that inspired me to start my own business, you know, because he had that. He had the dry cleaner. Person, yeah, and, I mean, you know, you weren't there at the time, but I mean, you know, he he'd get dressed fast, go to the locker room. I said, "What the heck's going on here?" He said, "I get back my office, you know, see what happened during the day." Well, I did the same thing, you know. I you know I had Linda pretty much in charge, my wife, you know, when I was gone. But you know, you still gotta you know see it for yourself right. and you know the people. All right, last thing, um, I'd be completely remiss if I didn't give you a chance to talk about the Zero Club, <laughs> which was which was basically you and Pat Tume and Blaine Nye. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. tell, and, and I, I wrote a little yeah. book uh, several years ago uh, called Stadium Stories, and one of the chapters was about the Zero Club, which, which yeah. the late, great Frank Luxa of the Dallas Times-Herald, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. he really invented it. Right. Right. Uh, named yeah. it, but it yeah. was, but it, and it's if you, you've got to find a way to read that story. But I, just tell people what the Zero Club was all about. Well, it was, you know, this was like in, you know, nineteen by nineteen seventy one. I mean, that was my fourth year, and, and Blaine's fourth year. We came in together. It was Pat's uh, thir- second year, and you know, we were going down to uh, 
you know, Saturday night and everybody's getting plans and they're going, you know, this is Thousand Oaks, California, you know, you go to the bar and go to this club, da da da, you know, just go out and try to, you know, go to a movie or do something and and Blaine and I were just in our room, we we're just laying there. But, you just had no motivation to right. get up and do anyway. Yeah. Do anything. Well, we were both married, and we shouldn't be out, you know, you know, patting around. But it was like there is a reason to get out, just to get out, you know. And uh, finally, you know, he came in and just, you know, kind of started that whole thing. It's like my God, and and then uh, finally we got shamed in. Said, all right, well, we'll go downtown. And so we hitched a ride with a rookie who <laughs> got a car, <laughs> took us downtown, and then. All the stories, you know, that started with Blaine and Pat. And, you know, first they gave me hell of writing the book. You know, they both did. It's like I said, well, I, you know, I got to promote this because otherwise it doesn't sell. And, and so I resigned from the Zero Club. And, and they said, no, no, you, it's not possible you, to resign. You, they did not accept your resignation. No, no, it's not possible for you to resign. Did they just fine you? <laughs> no, they, they just... Uh, uh, I, they just uh, quit commenting, and uh, and uh, now Blaine. I've talked to Blaine, you know, since that time. Actually, he's kind of enjoyed that, and you know, he's he was uh, such a good roommate, and, and still is a good friend. You see him, you know, real close uh, every couple of years. We, you know, we get together. I, I saw him uh, a couple of years ago in California. He's just yeah. he is just uh, Blaine. And I, by the way, yeah. is the. Apropos of absolutely nothing, he's the father-in-law of one of Troy Aikman's teammates at UCLA, right. yes. Tom White Knight, yes. and, uh, and right. then Pat yeah. Toomey, a, a, um, an accomplished writer, one of the brightest people. He, the, yeah. Those two guys yeah. were two of the brightest that ever played for this yeah. or any other yeah. franchise, yeah. and you snuck in there too, yeah. and you described the one thing, was it a media day of the Super Bowl, Yeah, and everybody's talking to everybody else, and the three of you are just yeah. sitting there? Yeah, and, and we're sitting there. Nobody wanted to talk to us, and then and they go up and start talking to guys on the specialty teams, for God's sake. <laughs> you know? And it's like, all right, I, you know, this kind of arrived, and finally says, okay, we don't want anybody to talk to us. Just stay away from us. And they did. <laughs> uh, if you want a good chuckle, uh, go, Google it, like yeah. Larry, Larry it. tells his grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, Google the Zero Club and Frank Luxa, L-U-K-S-A. Yeah. Uh, and then, if you want a life lesson, uh, as well as a, uh, a great little history of the Dallas Cowboys before they became America's team, uh, the book is Living the Dream on America's Team, and the author is Larry Cole, who made my favorite play in the last 43 years of the <laughs> Dallas Cowboys. Great to see you. Thanks well, for your time. Well, good to see you. And, yeah, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and uh, Google Play and iTunes. So, anyway, but... Uh, Anyway, good to see you, and uh, I uh, admire your work that you've done through the years. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, it uh, really is uh, quite a career that you've had, also. I'm still, I'm still hanging in there. Yep. Thank you very much. I haven't, I didn't do as well as you did. I can't afford to retire. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, the great number sixty three, Larry Cole. This is then and now. I'm Brad Sham. 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 I'm Brad.